word that God himself, when it is carried out faithfully, uh, would speak to us. And so let us come now to hear God's word and to hear it preached. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests and the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And he went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. He said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him, how to destroy him. Let's pray once more together. Father, whether or not we're as cognizant of this fact as we ought to be, we are now coming before your authoritative, inspired, inerrant, and sufficient word. Help us, Lord, to recognize what it is we're doing, that through your word you speak to your people, through your word you commune with your people, Uh, through your word you convict, you edify, you rebuke, and you build up. Please, Lord, would you come to us through your word now and Deal with our hearts. Come to us and minister to us. Even now, as we have set aside this time to come before your word, bless this hour. Make it fruitful for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Who were the Pharisees? That is an important question, especially if we're to understand the gospel accounts where the Pharisees are are prominent characters. Uh, You may have no knowledge of the Bible or the Christian faith, but if a person used the word Pharisee uh, out in public, I suppose many people in our culture would have some notion at least of what they meant by it. Uh, They would probably think a Pharisee is one who is is sort of holier than thou, one who is is self-righteous, one who is maybe legalistic, supercilious, think they're better than other people. And I think many in the evangelical church would have a similar understanding of that word, that noun, Pharisee. Uh, I think there's a good deal more to the picture that we learn from the Bible But I think people who have that notion of what it might mean to be a Pharisee, they're barking up the right tree. Um, I think they're, they're, they're on the hunt. We were introduced to the Pharisees, in Matthew's gospel at least, in chapter 3. Uh, There the Pharisees approach John the Baptist. They actually don't say anything, and we understand presumably from John's response to them uh, that they were coming with duplicitous motives. They weren't coming for the right reasons, and John rebukes them, tells them to leave calls them a brood of vipers. The Pharisees are mentioned again in chapter 5. They don't say any words there. They're mentioned by Jesus. And there Jesus says in Matthew 5 verse 20 that the righteousness of his disciples is meant to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And there Jesus is not talking about his righteousness imputed to us. He's talking actually about our practical experiential righteousness. God's people ought to be more righteous than those who give themselves to a Pharisaical righteousness. The next place where where the Pharisees are mentioned is in chapter 9. A few times in chapter 9, the Pharisees are mentioned. That's the first time they speak. And by that point, it's clear the Pharisees are staunch critics of Jesus. They are seeking to subvert his authority. They are seeking to upend his ministry. They are seeking to trap him, to catch him, to expose him as sinful, blasphemous, a lawbreaker. They are against Jesus. Well, the Pharisees, we learn, were zealous religious laymen who studied the law and devoted themselves to a complex web of oral traditions, things even beyond the law of Moses itself. They were known for their legal exactness and their stringent adherence to the Mosaic law, but also, this is key, 
They were also committed to a series of man-made laws that formed a kind of fence around the law, sort of ensured that you would never really actually approach breaking the law because there were laws even outside of the Mosaic law itself that uh, were established for God's people to observe, at least so the Pharisees thought. The Pharisees hated Jesus with a violent hatred. That is clear in our passage this morning. It will become increasingly clear from this point on in Matthew's gospel. They wish to, as verse 14 says, destroy Jesus. That's who the Pharisees were. Of course, a more important question is who is Jesus? Who did he claim to be? And how did he claim to fulfill the expectations of the Hebrew Scriptures? And what is it that he came to do? Who is Jesus? And friends, I think this is actually the central question of this passage. We learn more about the Pharisees. But I think the central question in this passage is who is Jesus? And what is he revealing to us here about himself? I think we are mistaken now if we think this passage is primarily about the Sabbath. I don't think that's the main point of the passage. Uh, It's not about how the Sabbath is to be observed or whether or not it's even to be observed in the New Covenant age. I know that some of you are interested in that question, whether or not uh, New Covenant Christians are obligated to keep the Old Testament Sabbath command. This is not a passage I would go to to address that question one way or the other. There are other passages that I think speak much more clearly to that question. For my part, I do not believe that new covenant saints are obligated to keep the Sabbath command of the Old Testament. There are several reasons why I think that. I think the arguments on the other side are kind of thin. Uh, But that said, we have members of our church who are Sabbatarian. Uh, We don't look down on that position. I have respect for that position. Uh, You are not required to hold to a certain view on the Sabbath in order to be a member here at Emmanuel. But anyway, that's not what this passage I think is about, whether or not that command continues into the new covenant. I don't think that's the issue. I think the central point of this passage is contained in verse 6 and verse 8. If you understand those verses, you will understand the passage. Verse 6, I tell you, Jesus says, something greater than the temple is here. And verse 8, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. This passage is about Jesus' identity, who he came to be and what he came to do. This morning, I hope we will learn more about Jesus. I'd like us to open up this text under two main headings. We will see first the Pharisee's accusation, and secondly, Jesus' response. Pretty simple outline. The Pharisee's accusation, Jesus' response, then a couple brief application points for us before coming to the Lord's table. Consider with me first the Pharisee's accusation. What is the nature of their accusation? Well, if we're unfamiliar with the world of Jesus, if we're unfamiliar with the world of the New Testament and how Jewish law operated, we may find this interchange a little confusing. We may find ourselves a bit at sea. What exactly are they talking about? What's going on here? Why is this such an issue? Is this issue of Sabbath? So what is the heart of the Pharisees' charge against Jesus? Well, we already know from other passages, as I've mentioned, that the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus. That's their goal. That's their aim. They want to catch him. In some kind of offense, some kind of transgression, some kind of contradiction in things he's teaching and saying, they want to show him in some way to be false, to be heretical, to be blasphemous. Remember, the Pharisees were hostile to Jesus. They viewed the progress of his ministry as averse to their own interests. He was to them a threat to their power and their position, and so they're always trying to catch him, always trying to trap him. Always trying to indict him, and of course, they are eventually successful at taking him up on blasphemy charges, among other charges. Now, repeatedly throughout the Gospels, we see that the Pharisees actually had meetings to strategize about how to take Jesus down. It is interesting to note, to go through the Gospel accounts, just note every time we have the Pharisees or the Sadducees, the scribes, the high priests meeting, strategizing, often late at night, to figure out how will we catch him. How can we undo this man? How can we destroy this man? Eventually, how can we arrest and kill this man? They wanted to catch Jesus, and they had a carefully crafted plan. And I think we see symptoms of their plan all throughout the Gospels. It does seem that there were a few particular issues uh, uh, around which the Pharisees' concerns sort of orbited. They're always trying to catch Jesus on blasphemy, claiming the authority that only God himself can claim. They're trying to portray him as someone who's against the law or a libertine, someone who doesn't observe the law, isn't in support of the Torah. Uh, They try to get him an issue of being demon-possessed. If he casts out demons, he must be possessed by demons himself. There are certain things that keep coming up. One of the central planks in their plan was this issue of the Sabbath. 
to show Jesus to be one who did not reverence the Sabbath. Jesus is one who didn't endorse the Sabbath. To show Jesus to be a Sabbath breaker. It comes up several times in the Gospels, comes up in our passage. This is part of their plan to expose and destroy Jesus. Now, I just want to review briefly what the Sabbath command actually is. I don't assume everybody here understands what the Sabbath command was in the Old Testament. Uh, there was, of course, the Sabbath command itself, which is the fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments given on tablets of stone by God through Moses to the people of Israel. The Ten Commandments, sometimes even today, you'll see them in courthouses and on, you know, different buildings and things like that. I was recently in Washington, D.C., saw the Ten Commandments posted in a couple of prominent places. It might be hard to believe that that's still the case. But uh, the Ten Commandments still have a place even in our national consciousness, though that may less and less be the case. The Sabbath command is the fourth commandment among those ten. The focus of the Sabbath commandment was upon rest, upon the cessation of labor and work. Some people often say it had to do with rest and worship, but really the worship piece is not brought up very much. We should not think, we should not imagine that old covenant Jews were like going to church every Sabbath. They didn't do that. Later on, synagogue worship was established, and that did occur on the Sabbath, but there were no synagogues when the Sabbath commandment was first given. There were a few times a year, perhaps, you might have gone up to the temple yourself, your family would be on the register, and you'd get to go up yourself, but it wasn't like going to church in the way some Sabbatarians think about today. The issue is rest, cessation from labor. Six days you shall work, the seventh, the Sabbath day, you shall rest. You should sanctify that day for a holy rest. Uh, the commandment also, not only was it in the Ten Commandments, it was to be a sign to the people of Israel of the covenant God made with the Israelites through Moses. God made a particular covenant with the Israelite people. It's a covenant that he did not enter into with the other nations of the world. It's a covenant that originates with the calling out of God's people from Egypt and becoming a, a nation, an ethnic people, a national theocratic people in the wilderness. And God says the Sabbath will be the sign of this covenant. Now, it is a covenant that has now ended. We don't live under the Mosaic Covenant anymore. That is called the Old Covenant, the covenant that has been uh, abolished or has been uh, uh, abrogated. It has been nullified. It is obsolete, the author Hebrews says in Hebrews 8, which is one of the reasons why I don't think the Sabbath command is enjoined on all Christians today, but that's an aside. It was a sign, though, for the people of Israel. This distinguishes you as my people. This is a sign of the covenant. The Sabbath should be caused to bring to your mind God's dealings with you, that He is your God, that you are His people, that you ought to set yourselves apart for Him, for him that you ought to be holy in some certain way, even in the way your weekly schedule is organized. It was a sign of the covenant God had entered into with His people, Israel. Now, by the time you get to Jesus' day, there had grown up around the Sabbath command numerous other uh, meticulous rabbinical laws that were not contained in the Old Testament itself, but kind of extrapolations and deductions and interpretations that different rabbis had accumulated over the years. And so there were lots of prescriptions related to Sabbath that actually were not in the Bible and yet were required or, or, or imposed upon the Jewish people by many of the religious leaders of the day. Long story short, it would not be hard to get someone on the Sabbath issue if you wanted to. The Pharisees wanted to portray Jesus as soft on the Sabbath and even as a Sabbath breaker and thus one who dishonored the Torah and dishonored God. Well, in the context of the Judaism of Jesus' day, of Second Temple Judaism, Sabbath breaking was seen as a cardinal offense. Not only was reverence for the Sabbath one of the Ten Commandments, a sign of the covenant God had made with Israel, it was one of the distinguishing vestiges of Jewish life under Roman occupation. If you were a Jew in Jesus' day, you would think, you know, we, we, we have these Gentile overlords, what a terrible situation. We, we, we don't have the land, we don't have the monarchy, we don't have all of our ways and customs, but we do have the temple, and we do have the Sabbath. It's one of the main ways the Jews were able to maintain their distinctive Jewish way of life, to remind them of their identity, their culture, their heritage, their rootedness, who they were. Therefore, to break the Sabbath was just a, a mammoth offense. So the Pharisees are looking to catch Jesus out, breaking the Sabbath. At verse 1 through 2, they see their window. We read that the Pharisees observed the disciples plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath, which, by the way, I think was permitted. Some ambiguity on that point, but the Pharisees don't see it that way. Now here's their chance. They're picking heads of grain. They're probably leisurely stroll maybe on a Sabbath afternoon. They're hungry. They're in need. Food was not as readily available in those days. Here's some heads of grain. Should we not pick these heads of grain? 
and eat them along the way to satisfy our hunger as we seek to follow Jesus and follow His direction. Well, now the Pharisees can get them because taking those heads of grain, that's technically harvesting, isn't it? That's technically labor. They're technically working on the Sabbath. They're technically breaking the Sabbath. Thus, it appears Jesus, the great rabbi, is encouraging Sabbath breaking among His disciples. He's a lawbreaker. He doesn't reverence the Torah or the Ten Commandments or the sign of the covenant. He claims to be sent from God, but He doesn't honor God or His law. That's the idea. In verse 10, we see a similar thing. Jesus enters the synagogue, presumably on the same day. It's also the Sabbath. There is a man present there with a withered hand, maybe some kind of skin disease or bone disease or something. We know, don't we, that Jesus loves to heal people. What's He going to do? Here's someone in need. Here's someone with a withered hand. Jesus tends to gravitate toward those people. Can we catch Him? Will He heal this man on the Sabbath? Well, the rabbinic opinion of the day, the Old Testament doesn't speak to this, but the rabbinic opinion of the day, the opinion of the rabbis, was that it was permissible to provide medical attention to someone in life-threatening cases. This isn't a life-threatening case. He's got a withered hand, maybe unpleasant, maybe painful, maybe a blemish that is unsightly, but, but he's not going to die from it. Will he heal this man on the Sabbath whose life is not being threatened? This is not the case in that setting. But Jesus can't resist a good healing. We can get him now. We can trap him. That's the nature of the Pharisees' accusation. Show Jesus to be a Sabbath breaker. Show him to be a law breaker. Get him on a legal technicality. Show him to be in violation of the letter of the law. That's the Pharisees' accusation. Now consider with me secondly now, Jesus' response. Consider with me Jesus' response. I think Jesus identifies two flaws in the Pharisee's charge, and these flaws that Jesus identifies will allow him, create the context for him to reveal certain things about himself. So I think what Jesus is going to say here transcends this conflict. He's saying bigger things than just this back and forth with the Pharisees. The flaws in their accusation, which Jesus will deftly expose, create the context for him to reveal things about his identity, his person, his work, who he came to be, what he came to do. Let's consider these two flaws, these two failures in the Pharisees' case that Jesus exposes. Number one, the first flaw, is a failure to understand the heart of the law. I should say that with the emphasis on the right word. It is a failure to understand the heart of the law. The Pharisees, as I said, profess to be teachers of the law. They are often paired with the scribes, scribes and Pharisees, who were purported to be legal scholars, legal experts. The Pharisees postured themselves as spokesmen for the Mosaic law, for the Torah. They were self-proclaimed enforcers of that law. Now, before we proceed with understanding their error, there is something important we need to understand. We need to understand what Jesus' critique is and what it isn't. Jesus' critique of the Pharisees here is not that somehow zeal for the law or love for God's law is a bad thing. That's not his critique. Rather, he's going to go after their interpretation of the law and their failure to understand the heart of the law. So don't misunderstand who the Pharisees are uh, and where the Pharisees went wrong. The failure of the Pharisees was not that they were pro-law, that they were pro-righteousness, that they were pro-commandment keeping. A lot of people today talk about the Pharisees in this way. Like their problem was that they were the law people when they should have been the grace people. Well, I don't think the Pharisees understood grace at all. But I also don't think they understood the law at all. They didn't get the law right. Not only would this be a mistaken understanding of who the Pharisees were, to say, well, they love the law, they're zealous for the law, and, and, you know, that's not really the point. Not only would that be a mistaken understanding of the Pharisees, but such a misunderstanding will potentially lead us to dangerous and false conclusions about Jesus' attitude toward the law and toward commandment keeping. If we think the fault of the Pharisees was that they loved the law too much or were too zealous for the law or that they should not have cared so much about keeping the law, we will conclude that Jesus is against love for the law, that He is against zeal for the law, and that he is against careful attention to the law, which is not Jesus' posture at all. 
It was written of Jesus that he delighted to do the will of God and that God's law was written on his heart. That's Psalm 40, verse 8, quoted with respect to Jesus in Hebrews 10. He loved the law of God, delighted in the law of God, and he knew the law of God aright. Jesus will say to his disciples in Matthew 5, verse 17, as we saw earlier in this series, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a yoda, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So don't think, please, brothers and sisters, don't think if I love the law, if I'm zealous for the law, if I want to uphold God's law, that is somehow a symptom of Pharisaism. The Apostle Paul himself said, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. We sing Psalm 19 together as a church. Jehovah's perfect law restores the soul again. That's not what Pharisaism is. A concern for holiness and a desire to avoid sinning and a passion for upholding God's law is not Pharisaical behavior. Loving the law of God aright was not the Pharisees' problem. No, here's the issue with the Pharisees. That's what it's not. Here's what it is. The issue with the Pharisees was that they didn't understand the law. They didn't comprehend the heart of the law. They manipulated the law. They misused the law. And they had a way of reading the law that was contrary to the heart of God and His will for His people. Pharisaism involved a certain defective attitude toward the law. It was an attitude that prioritized meticulous and legalistic exactitude over the demands of love and mercy that ultimately formed the heart of the law itself. It was outward form over inward substance. It was superficial exactness over the beating heart of the law. And what's more, they failed to understand the ways in which Jesus himself fulfilled the law. Pharisaism ignored Jesus' authority as the final arbiter and interpreter of the law and all the many ways in which the law found its telos and its completion in Jesus. They failed to understand the heart of the law, and they failed to perceive all the ways in which the law pointed to Jesus and found its fulfillment, its end, its goal, its satisfaction in Him. This is where Jesus goes in his critique of the Pharisees. He quotes again, Hosea 6, 6 to them. I say again because we saw Jesus quoted this earlier in Matthew 9, 13, when the Pharisees complained that Jesus ate with sinners, he was having tax collectors over to the house. Jesus says, go and learn what this means. Hosea 6, 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He quotes it again here. Jesus again reminds them of the principle. In Hosea 6, 6, there God says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. These men, these disciples are hungry. Why should they not satisfy their hunger by plucking these heads of grain? Feeding the hungry is no violation of the Sabbath principle. Listen to what Jesus says. Look at the text in verse 3. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. What's he saying? What's he referring to? He's saying, don't you understand your own scriptures? When David was on the run from Saul in 1 Samuel 21 and he was hungry, he entered the tabernacle and ate the bread of the presence, which technically, technically, he was not to eat. And yet, don't you know he was not condemned for that action? The scriptures don't censure him for that action. The demands of mercy and the need on the part of the Lord's anointed prevailed over the technical requirement of Torah. And Jesus presents this as self-evident. Like, was David to starve in that situation? Like, duh. He ate the bread. He was dying. He was on the run. Needed bread. That supersedes the Sabbath command. And we kind of get this ourselves, don't we? Yeah, but by, 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 by focusing in on legal, exact technicality, we can actually manipulate the law itself. Uh, we had a couple hours as a family at the pool yesterday. Beautiful day. Kids were in the water. And at some point, you know, two of my kids who remain nameless, there's um, something going on in the pool. And I bark out to one of them, stop touching your sister. Leave her alone. 
without touching her. Uh, now, hopefully my son grasped the heart of what I was getting out there. He was bothering her, harassing her, splashing her, whatever. Stop touching her. Leave her alone. Uh, if my daughter started to drown and my son just went, <laughs> not supposed to touch my sister. My like Canaan said, son, wh why didn't you help her? And so he said, I wasn't supposed to touch her. Well, we wouldn't regard that as God-honoring obedience. We would regard that as something heinous. The greater demands of life and intervening in this situation should have clearly, self-evidently superseded my earlier command, given the context. Jesus then says, verse 5, or how have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless, meaning uh, the priests on the Sabbath perform their sacrifices and ceremonies. They do their job on the Sabbath. They are doing their priestly work and engaging in conduct that could be considered as technically prohibited by the Sabbath command. But the self-evident point is what? The demands of mercy and of atonement and of the work of the temple take precedent over the Sabbath prohibitions. Legal exactitude with respect to the Sabbath misses the heart of the law, misses the weightier issues, the demands of mercy. And this is where Jesus goes in verse 7. He says, and if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. I don't regard them as sinners. The Pharisees, listen, were those who would rather let a man starve than violate a rabbinic rule regarding the plucking of grain on the Sabbath. That's their error. The Pharisees were those who would keep the Messiah from healing a man's disease on the Sabbath because technically doctors are not supposed to work on Saturdays unless there's an emergency. The Pharisees were hypocrites. They were those who would pull their own sheep out of a ditch on the Sabbath but would leave a man behind to suffer. The Pharisees were those who, like the priest and the Levite in Luke 10, would pass by a bleeding man rather than help him lest they become unclean or violate the Sabbath. This kind of exactness and fastidiousness about legal technicalities while neglecting the demands of mercy was not seen by Jesus as commendable piety. Rather, it was seen as positively perverse and a distortion of the law, a failure to understand the heart of the law, a perverse form of legalism that favors strict ceremonial cleanness over the imperatives of love, strict outward superficial legal exactitude over life itself. This is Jesus' first critique of the Pharisees then, that they do not understand the heart of the law. God says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. If you understood the heart of God and the heart of this law, you would not condemn the guiltless. Now, the second flaw. Under point number two, Jesus' response, he identifies that first flaw. They don't understand the heart of the law. Second flaw, our failure on the part of the Pharisees. And that is their failure to understand who Jesus is and the implications of his coming. They don't understand Jesus and the implications of his coming. Let us appreciate again how Jesus reasons here. There's a very tight logic in the text. Jesus wants to take them to a point, to a place. He wants to assert some things about himself. So look again, if you would, at verse 3. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? So, so far, so good, right? We get what he's saying. The connection between this anecdote in 1 Samuel 21 and the situation with Jesus' disciples is clear enough. David was hungry and he ate, not condemned. My disciples were hungry and they eat, they're not condemned. But what about verse 5? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? Okay, of what relevance is it that the priests profane the Sabbath in the temple. Why bring up the temple at all? What's his point? You need to track with me here, because I think this is the heart of the passage. I believe Jesus is saying the authority of the temple is greater than the authority of the Sabbath. The work of the temple supersedes the Sabbath prohibition. They've got to go in there and offer sacrifices. The temple authority greater than Sabbath authority. Whatever happens in the temple supersedes whatever demands we might imagine the Sabbath to make upon the priests. I think that's pretty clear. 
The work of the temple is of greater priority than the Sabbath prohibitions. The greater work and the greater authority of the temple makes the priests exempt from the Sabbath prohibitions, which then leads Jesus to his next statement in verse 6. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Sabbath, important. Temple, more important. Something even greater than the temple is here. What's Jesus saying? Unless it's not obvious to you. He's saying, I'm here. I'm here. Do you understand what we're talking about? One greater than the temple is standing before you. And if the demands of the temple supersede the demands of the Sabbath, and I am greater than the temple, I am greater than the Sabbath. Indeed, as verse 8 says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. What's his point? Jesus, in these two statements, I'm greater than the temple, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, is making a point of mammoth significance here. These were the big vestiges of Jewish life. These were the big things. We have the Sabbath, we have the temple. Jesus says, I'm better than both, greater than both, greater than the temple, Lord of the Sabbath. Do you understand who it is who's speaking to you? You see, the Pharisees' problem is not only that they misunderstood the heart of the law, the issue is they don't understand who it is who's standing in front of them, the very giver of the law. The true and greater Moses, we could say. Jesus is saying, I'm here now, and I am Lord of the Sabbath. I'm here, and I'm greater than the Sabbath, greater than the temple. I have authority you do not seem to comprehend. I invented the Sabbath. I am the author of the Sabbath. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I am greater than the temple. What's more, the Sabbath and the temple were only pointing forward to me. You're hung up on the type and the shadow, and the reality is standing before you. The Sabbath was to point ahead to the Lord of the Sabbath. The temple was to point ahead to the one greater than the temple, even the true and better temple, the true and better access point to God, the one who nullifies the temple. It's me, Jesus Christ himself. You're going to question my authority. You're going to question my disciples. You're going to write me as a Sabbath breaker? I got news for you. I invented the thing. The issue is the Pharisees didn't understand who Jesus was. They didn't understand the implications of his coming. They failed to grasp the moment. Some people say nowadays, you know, the church today, preachers today, they need to know what time it is. The Pharisees didn't know what time it is. They didn't know the moment. They didn't grasp what was happening. The revelation that was before them, the shifting of the ages. The Lord of the Sabbath was before them. The Messiah has come. The age is shifting. The one greater than Moses is in their midst. The Son of David, the Lord of the Sabbath, the true and better temple. The kingdom is dawning on them in Christ, and they weren't grasping it, along with its many implications. So in sum, how does Jesus respond to the Pharisees' accusation? What flaws does he identify in their charge? Two in particular. They did not understand the heart of the law. They did not understand that God desires mercy and not sacrifice. And secondly, they didn't understand who Jesus was, nor did they understand the implications of his coming. The one greater than the temple is here. The Lord of the Sabbath has come. I shift now to some lessons for us before we come to the Lord's table. I struggled a little bit this week thinking how to apply this passage. I want to go to to two specific issues, one that I hope is obvious from the passage, one maybe not as obvious, but I hope will become clearer, its connection to my exposition this morning. Two points of application for us. What do we do with this text? What's its bearing on us for our lives now? Two points of application. Number one, we must beware of Pharisaism or a Pharisaical spirit. We must beware of Pharisaism or a pharisaical spirit. I don't think we should typically think of regenerate Christian people as Pharisees. So when I have a church member before me, someone who I have every reason to believe is a Christian, 
I don't think of them as Pharisees. Some people will talk about Christian people as acting like Pharisees. I, I just don't really think that's altogether appropriate. Pharisees hated Jesus. Pharisees undermined God's law. They had no comprehension of grace. They were hypocrites. I don't think we should think of one another or other born-again Christians often as Pharisees. Here's one practical reason for that, maybe apropos of nothing, but I'll mention it anyway. Uh, it's not uncommon to hear people nowadays say, um, we need to, you know, we need to talk a little more tough as the church. Preachers, Christians need to talk a little more tough. Let's look at the statements that Jesus made about the Pharisees. And they will somehow look at that as a kind of paradigm that they're to use for like internecine debates between Christians. I think that's awful. I think that's awful. I think it's really problematic to go to Jesus' words against the Pharisees, his judgments, his pronouncements over them in general as a paradigm for how we're to speak even to opponents. It's a complicated subject, but I think there are all kinds of reasons we do not stand in the same position as Jesus when we are called upon to rebuke our opponents. But it's certainly not a way we should speak to brothers and sisters in the church. Like, like as if, if you're becoming kind of pharisaical, or it seems like you're becoming a little legalistic, I need to give you the old brood of vipers line. No, I don't think so. I think that's a misunderstanding. The Pharisees were wicked men. Wicked men bent on undermining the Christ. Well, I could have a brother or sister who may not understand grace or right, or might have a tendency toward legalism. That doesn't make them a Pharisee. That's a disclaimer. That said, when we see Pharisaism illustrated so strikingly in texts like this one, we should be warned in our hearts against Pharisaism. That may sound like a contradiction to what I just said. But later on in this gospel, in Matthew 16, Jesus will warn his disciples, his disciples, to beware the leaven of the Pharisees. D don't imbibe their teaching. Don't imbibe their spirit. D don't allow yourself to go along with some of their conclusions or to start assuming their posture. It's possible. Even one of my disciples could begin to, you know, listen to the Pharisees. D don't do that. So I think it's appropriate that we, nonetheless, as Christians, who ourselves may not be Pharisees, are not Pharisees, that we be warned against a Pharisaical spirit. And it may even in subtle ways manifest itself in our own lives, in our families, in our churches. We can be guilty of this, failing to grasp the weightier matters of the law. We could become fastidious about technicalities while ignoring the heart of the law. Punctilious about forms over substance. A few examples. Here's a man or woman in serious, urgent, practical need. But you have small group tonight. Or prayer meeting or Bible study. Well, I'm a churchman and I don't miss. Don't have time to help this person. Got to get to church. I can't really be bothered to give a ride to an older saint because I'm too busy preparing my heart for worship. It's my custom. I, I read John Owen on Sunday mornings. I get, get up and go give this person a ride. How many Christians have passed by the needy on their way to satisfy their perceived religious duty? This is true religion, James says, to do good to orphans and widows. I've seen husbands and fathers ruin their families over their fastidiousness over church commitments and their false sense of obligation to read tons of theology and they're chasing after fruitless debates over this and that in the evangelical world. They're all on the discernment blogs and they can tell you what's going on and the Southern Baptist Convention and with the Gospel Coalition and with this denomination and that denomination. And all the while, they neglect their families and they fail to do good to their neighbors. The ethic in the home was not spiritual nurture, but a pretended piety, a kind of pharisaical ostentation when it came to spiritual things, and a superficial penchant for theological debate. And all the while, their families suffered. Their kids felt unloved. Their wives felt neglected, but he was known as an armchair theologian and a serious church guy. 
And he loved cultivating that carefully manicured appearance. And he successfully convinced himself and others that he was righteous. How about in parenting? Parents, can we become more concerned that our kids don't drink? Or that they don't listen to a particular kind of music? Or that they wear the right clothes? Or that they maintain a certain image than we are about whether or not they're actually born again in their hearts? Or that they're open and honest about their sin and failure, and that they receive gospel help and support from mom and dad. There are some homes in which the ethos is legal exactness, or a certain kind of appearance to be maintained, the letter of the law, and the weightier matters of love and mercy are neglected, and the children can feel it. They can sense that what is most important to mom and dad is that I walk a straight line. Meanwhile, the weightier matters of repentance and faith and following Christ and making Him your treasure, how to navigate failure with the help of Christ, that was never talked about in the home. Some of you maybe grew up in homes like that. If you did, that's not how it should have been. Moms and dads, always remember this. Your kids will remember what you got excited about. They will remember what you got excited about. And my encouragement to you as one struggling parent to another is make sure it's the right things you're getting excited about. Some parents will act like certain things just, just you know, destroy their whole universe because the kid didn't pass the grade or something like that or get the scholarship or whatever. Uh, I'm not saying you can't be disappointed by that. But make sure your child knows what's far more important to mom and dad is that I know the Lord, that I'm honest about my sin, that I'm open to grace, that I receive the support and help of the gospel. There are some who would boast of how free they are from worldliness. They keep themselves from raunchy movies and shows and music, and they are unstained from sinners, and they keep themselves separate from them. They think, I will be so pure and so upright as to never let sinners eat at my table. They'll never set foot in my house. Someone uses vulgar speech in my hearing, and I will withdraw from them. And such people are never brought within the sound of the gospel and within the context of Christian love, where Jesus would have eaten with them and revealed himself to them and loved them. Perhaps some of us would withdraw from them on the grounds that we are simply being zealous for God's law and God's name, and we're maintaining our separateness from the world. Friends, surely there are much better examples than these, but we should be mindful of this. We can approach the law of God in a way that ultimately distorts it and misuses it, in a way that fails to grasp its heart. If you want to know how to avoid this kind of error, I would just urge you, study Jesus. Study His teaching. Uh, Study how He presents the commandments, and you won't go amiss. See how prominent the demands of love and mercy are in the moral vision of Jesus. If you allow Jesus to be your teacher, your interpreter of the law, as he ought to be, the true and greater Moses, I don't think he'll go wrong. Application point number two, and then we'll be done. We must always read the Old Testament through the lens of the person and work of Christ. We must always read the Old Testament through the lens of the person and work of Christ. You do not want to read the Old Testament in the same way a faithful Jew read it uh, 3,000 years ago. A lot has happened since then that has major bearings on how we read the Old Testament. A question you must ask often when reading the Old Testament is this, how does the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, How does the death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, how does the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, influence how I am to understand this passage? This figure, this institution, this event, this text, what bearing does the coming of Christ have on how I understand my Old Testament? The Pharisees of Jesus' day did not understand that Jesus was the telos, the end, the goal of the Old Testament Scriptures. 
He was what it was all pointing toward, but they didn't understand this. Their error was that they measured him by those Old Testament ceremonies, institutions, and laws rather than measuring those ceremonies, institutions, and laws by him. Jesus is the great hermeneutical key for the whole Bible. He's the great principle of interpretation. It's like, oh, I get it. I see it now through Jesus. He brings the Old Testament expectations to their climax, to their fulfillment, to their completion. He gives them their proper interpretation. And as a rule, we must read the Old Testament with its ceremonies, institutions, and laws through the person and work of Christ. And by doing this, listen, it's an important point. This won't have the effect of making the Old Testament irrelevant to us. Rather, we will be brought to see its burning relevance in pointing ahead to Christ. The whole book of Hebrews is unintelligible without the Old Testament. Much of this gospel is unintelligible apart from the Old Testament. The Old Testament, y'all, prepares us for Christ and informs us of what His ministry and His work and His law and His covenant are meant to be. We will properly honor the Old Testament and honor the law of God when we read it through Christ. We will properly understand it and apply it when we read it through the Lord. I'll briefly illustrate by a few examples, drawing to a close here. Imagine that somehow there was a temple re-erected in Israel. Let's say now there was a temple re-erected after the patterns of the Old Covenant prescriptions. Imagine how ungodly a thing it would be to offer sacrifices in that temple. That would be blasphemy. Now, why would it be so terrible to offer up sacrifices in the temple? Because Jesus Christ has come, the final sacrifice, the once-for-all sacrifice. No priest is entering in any other place if his name isn't Jesus. And I don't want any blood appealing for me except for His blood. It would be a blasphemous thing. It would be going backwards. What? There's a whole new situation. Christ has come. The Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. There's no need for that temple anymore. It's blessedly irrelevant. Well, there are other ways that I think we can be guilty of this. Failing to understand the significance of the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus for interpreting the Scriptures. You might think of how some view worship. There are still some today who think you need to have certain sacred spaces and ornate buildings and certain elaborate ceremonies in order to worship God. Like, it has to be in a certain place. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, the Victorian preacher in the 1800s, he preached in the open air. That was illegal for Anglicans to do in the 1800s. It was believed you had to be inside a, a dedicated building. What's wrong with that? The one greater than the temple has come. We don't need to come to Jesus, to God now, on the terms of some kind of temple or innate building or something like that or through certain ceremonies. We come to God through Jesus Christ, His Son. And as Jesus says to the woman at the well, it's not this mountain or that mountain that we will worship. We will worship God in spirit and truth. That could be outside under a palm tree. It could be in a building like this. It could be in a cathedral. But if you think that God must be worshipped in a certain sacred space with a certain kind of architecture, what are you missing? The implications of the coming of the Son of God. You have some who think they need to confess their sins through a priest or through a pastor. What's wrong with that? Again, it fails to reckon with the implications of Christ's coming. You have some who think part of the mission of the church should be to get nation states to organize their governments along the lines of the civil and judicial laws of the Old Testament people of Israel, that that's actually a scriptural mandate, and that God wants to constitute His people today as Christian nations, and therefore, part of the church's mission, they think, is to enforce the judicial laws of the Israelite people. What's wrong with that? It fails to reckon with the implications of Jesus coming. Jesus is not now constituting His people as an ethnic, linguistic nation or people. He's constituting them as local churches, the true nation, the true ethnos, 
That's how he constitutes his people now, and that informs the mission of the church. People lose their way, and they recede into old practices, and they misunderstand the Old Testament because they fail to appreciate the ways in which Christ and his work have changed things and have created a new situation, and they hold on to Old Testament ceremonies and institutions and laws that have been brought to completion in Christ. Friends, the Lord has come. The age has shifted. The one greater than the temple has arrived. The Lord of the Sabbath has come. Let us not be guilty of failing to appreciate what He has achieved and what He has revealed and what He has brought to completion and what He has brought to fulfillment in His coming. Let us instead read all of redemptive history through Christ and understand that God has now spoken in these last days through His Son. The Word has become flesh The God-man has dwelt among us, and He has brought the final and climactic revelation from the Father. He has fulfilled the law. He has fulfilled all the types and shadows. Don't miss Jesus. And friends, don't go backwards. Let us submit to His authority, to His reign and rule, and to His kingdom. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would help us to understand what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Help us to understand the heart of the law. Help us to understand your will. We would delight in your will. We would delight in your law. We would delight in all your ways. And we would come before your son as our great teacher. The great lawgiver. The one who could show us the way. And we would sit at his feet and learn. Would you teach us, Lord, the heart of the law? If there are any here this morning who were perhaps reared in a context of heavy-handed legalism, exactness with respect to the letter, and a failure to appreciate and understand the demands of love and mercy, we pray, Father, that those bruised souls would have the sweet experience of finding something new and better in Jesus and finding the heart of the law. Father, we pray also that you would help us to understand all the implications of Jesus coming. Pray that we would love the one who is said to be greater than the temple, who is the new access point to God. That we would love the one who is now our great high priest, the final once for all sacrifice the Lord of the Sabbath, our Sabbath rest. We pray, Lord, that we would comprehend all the ways in which Christ has brought a new and blessed situation for us, one indeed that Moses, if he could live to see it, would envy, would desire. Help us not to go backwards. Help us to understand what time it is. Help us to understand that you have spoken through your Son and that his coming has changed everything. There's so many ways we need to grasp this. Help us, Lord, be our teacher. Bless us now as we come before this symbol of the gospel itself, the communion table, to remember the death of our Savior in our place. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.